All right. Good morning, everybody. Today is Monday, April 11th. Welcome to First Things First, Simply Cyber's daily morning cybersecurity threat briefing. I'm your host, Gerald Dozier. And over the next 30 minutes, I'll be delivering the top cybersecurity news of the day and providing expert analysis on each of these stories. What it means to you as a practitioner, or if you're looking to break into the industry, certainly going to be useful. And stay tuned if you are looking to break into the industry when I talk about what's coming on Simply Cyber Live this Thursday. Really special episode. Shout out and thanks to this stream sponsor, Barricade Cyber Solutions, your partner for incident response, ransomware protection, and business recovery. I want to remind you, if you hold professional certifications that require CPEs, each episode of First Things First is worth a half a CPE, so two and a half a week, roughly 10 a month. Be sure to document literally the easiest and I would argue the most enjoyable way to earn CPEs. If you're live with us, love it. I see you in chat. Love it when you guys are here spending the morning with you. If you're on replay, I get it. It's cool. Thanks for catching the stream. I hope you get value out of it. If you want to jump right to the news, then if you're on replay, the ticker in the corner gets to zero. We start the briefing. So feel free to scrub right to that zero and dive in. But for the next one minute, 35 seconds, I will be welcoming folks into the stream. Good morning, Adrian, Pellon, Carrie, Brian, I see you. Hey, Kareem. I saw Eric Taylor dropping in there. Amadou, hello. Hey, James, good to see you. Hope everybody's well. Good weekend, Monday. So we're going big, big cup of coffee. Hey, Pamela. Oh, yeah. Elroy's in the house. Stella's up in here. Mm. Very good. I know the website's down, simplycyber.io. I was doing some uh, annual annual maintenance, right? I, I called out some of the, the dead sites that were on, on the free resources. I made some links that were broken work. I spruced it up a little bit. I have, you know, whatever, merch that I don't really talk about. But the links were going to my old merch shop, so I switched those. Everything was good. And the last thing as I was hitting publish was like, Hey, what about DNSSEC? Couldn't hurt to do that since I'm in here. So I enabled that. That takes 24 hours to percolate. <laughs> so it broke my site. And this morning I came in and I said, hell, I, I don't really need DNSSEC. So I disabled it and then read into it a little bit. That takes 48 hours to percolate. So um, whatever. SimplyCyber.io is on a mental health break for a few days, I guess. The website is is down for a few days. <laughs> hey, Jax, good to see you. Joe Hyde, what's up, man? Alfredo, Christopher, cheers on the coffee tip. Mm -mm. I hope you're not suggesting I switch from coffee to tea, Adrian. That That's not going to work. I do tea in the afternoons. Coffee is my go juice in the morning. All right, it looks like that timer's gone down to zero. Hopefully you guys can hear the music. I was doing something new with, uh, with the music. I like the Nobody Speaks track. All right, guys. It's that time. Let's roll. You know the deal. If you want to play along, go to sissoseries.com. Sissoseries.com is where we get our news. David Spark and his gang, they do a fantastic job every weekday of throwing this podcast out there and helping us be able to be the best practitioners we can. Sit back, relax, and let's get into the news. It's cybersecurity headlines. It's Monday, April 11th, 2022. New Meta Information Stealer Distributed in Mal Spam Campaign. Meta, M E T A, is a new info stealer malware that appears to be rising in popularity among cyber criminals. Along with Mars Stealer and Blackguard, its operators apparently wish to take advantage of Raccoon Stealer's exit from the market that left many searching for their next platform. Meta is sold at $125 for monthly subscribers or $1,000 for unlimited lifetime use and is promoted as an improved version of Redline. Following the standard approach of a macro-laced Excel spreadsheet arriving in prospective victims' inboxes as an email attachment, it is being deployed to steal passwords stored in Chrome... Edge and Firefox, as well as cryptocurrency wallets. Okay. So, guys, basically, it looks like, you know, just another info stealer that's taken the, taken the market. So, you should be aware of it, right? Uh, Redline info stealer was a big one that I was aware of. They talked about Raccoon. I wasn't familiar with that one, but it, it doesn't matter. It's the, it's the 
methodology of this particular malware family that's relevant, right? So you can, it, it's Meta Stealer today. Maybe it's Mira's Stealer next week, right? So don't worry about that. Just know, look at the, look at the attack path, right? Look at the kill chain. Sp spam email, so phishing emails with malicious attached macro lace documents that need to be enabled. Right here is where the, the victim is actually running it on their machine. And then at that point, it takes off by its own. It goes, pulls down a second stage payload, which executes on the box, and then C2 traffic and all that stuff. So nasty stuff, guys. As you as you should know, right? Like as we get um, more and more zero trust and more and more user-based security versus, you know, uh, network-based security, although they're both important, these type of info stealers are going to be more and more valuable, more and more useful to threat actors because they need your credentials. They need to get your wallet credentials, your social credentials, your email credentials, all these things. And this is how they're doing it. So my advice to you, I know that we talked a while ago, Microsoft had has, it's either disabled macros by default or removed macros. Uh, I think it's disabled by default through a group policy type thing. I can't remember exactly the story, but the news, the thing is like, you don't really need macros in your in your spreadsheets and stuff people like yeah you probably have some financial and accounting individual who has like a macro lace document that they have built over years but by and large 99 percent of your end users don't need macros so disabling it by default and allowing by explicit approval only is definitely going to cut this kill chain right here and you're not going to get all of this other nasty business down here so educate your end users on phishing don't you know, and tell them about malicious attachments. Don't let them run macros and you will be fine with this one. NB65 Group targets Russia with a modified version of Conti's ransomware. According to Bleeping Computer, the NB65 hacking group has been targeting Russian organizations with ransomware that they have developed using the leaked source code of the Conti ransomware. Apparently joining forces with Anonymous, it has hit multiple Russian targets, including all Russia state television and radio broadcasting company and the Russian space agency Roscosmos. Since the end of March, the NB-65 crew has started using its own ransomware to target Russian entities. The group has apparently also modified the encryption process to stop its Russian victims from using a decryptor that had been provided by the Conti gang, which has announced its support for Russia in the conflict. Wow. Okay. Elon Musk. So, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so there's a lot going on here. Okay. So check this out. Again, this is Russian, Ukrainian, um, you know, crowdsourced IT army type stuff. NB65 is a pro Ukraine, um, non nation state cyber actor group. Uh, and they are targeting Russia. Now, what makes this particularly poetic is that NB65 is using Conti's ransomware against Russia. Conti's famously the ransomware threat actor group that once the conflict broke out, they publicly announced that they were going to support Russia. They had internal conflict. Uh, allegedly, Ukrainian members of Conti released tons and tons of internal documentation around Conti, and that, that group splintered, and their source code got re uh, leaked. Now, I wasn't surprised that the source code would get reused by a threat actor, but I... I couldn't have predicted, and again, this is poetic, that the, that that leaked software would be weaponized against essentially the group that the Conti was trying to support in the first place. And an extra little twist of the knife at the end is is disabling the the ability for the decryption keys to work uh, on Russian systems. So they're really thoughtful, I guess. Like to you know, not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying they're very deliberate and thoughtful about how they were going to weaponize this Conti strain of ransomware against Russia to ensure it inflicted maximum damage. And then of course you've got your token, uh, you know, tweet to the public about, you know, we suggest you check your machines. They're struggling. So interesting, interesting stuff. Unveils vision for Twitter after joining the board. <clears throat> After buying a 9.2% stake in the company, Musk has, in a series of Twitter posts, expressed his concern over the company's moderation policies. In late March, after he had acquired his stake in the company, but before he had disclosed that publicly, he tweeted a poll asking users whether Twitter adhered to the principle of free speech. He said, quote, given that Twitter serves as the de facto public town square, failing to adhere to free speech principles fundamentally undermines democracy, end quote. He added next, what should be done? 
Other ruminations focus on an edit button and whether Twitter Blue members should all get a check mark. Okay, so <clears throat> if you didn't hear about this, Elon Musk, aka Tony Stark, uh, decided to buy ten percent of Twitter <laughs> over the weekend or, or the end of last week. So obviously, we all know Twitter, a platform uh, for you know a public discourse. A lot of toxicity going on in there. A lot of good information being shared on there. A lot of people going there first. I know I, myself personally, um, when there's a breaking news story, like like when WannaCry was way, like crashing across Europe and heading towards the United States back in 17, I remember going to Twitter to, to like get up to date information. I mean, you're getting, you're, it's like, it's not distilled. It's not filtered it's it's you're getting it direct right like i said before kevin beaumont on twitter gossy the dog or at gossy the dog great source of intel when there's like an active thing going on <clears throat> so elon buying uh 10 obviously he's on the board now he's going to have massive influence into the uh direction of twitter i'm not going to get too deep in this because it gets into these one of these things where it's like yeah if if whoever's in control of twitter is controlling the narrative of certain messaging right so not allowing amplification of certain kind of agenda items and, um, you know, maybe not stopping bots from doing things, right? That That's not good. But then at the same time, if you have just outright vitriol and cyberbullying and all these other things and, and uh, um, intentional disinformation campaigns to confuse or dissuade or cause panic, um, that's where it gets really confusing, right? The famous Supreme Court case, that said you free speech is free speech, but you can't walk into a crowded theater and yell fire, like put that into a digital age. Like, so I, I don't know what's going to go on with this, but it's fascinating. Obviously Elon's a very influential wealthiest person in the world. So uh, stay tuned. New Android banking malware remotely takes control of your device. Octo O C T O is an evolved Android malware based on Exo Compact, which enables the threat actors to perform on device fraud by remotely controlling the compromised Android device. Remote access is provided through a live screen streaming module updated every second through Android's media projection and remote actions through the accessibility service. Octo uses a black screen overlay to hide the victim's remote operations, sets screen brightness to zero, and disables all notifications by activating the no interruption mode. By making the device appear to be turned off, the malware can perform various tasks without the victim knowing. These include screen taps, gestures, text writing, clipboard modification, data pasting, and scrolling up and down. Wow. Okay, so this is called Octo. It's an Android malware and, you know, chat, uh, let me know what you think. I mean, obviously we talk about Android malware all the time, it, you know, threat actors make a lot of it, but this one is real. This is like NSO group level espionage type stuff. It literally puts a black screen on the screen and reduces the brightness to zero. So you're not even likely to notice that it's on. And then the threat actor essentially has complete control to do anything as if they physically had it in their hand and they're able to tap around. This is nasty business right here. Um, I would imagine an app with Octo installed on it. I mean, not an app, a, um, a device with Octo installed on it is completely done. You need to absolutely re-image it and hope that this thing doesn't have any type of like, you know, boot level uh, infection, like a, a, a boot, tro a boot root kit or something. Cause Otherwise, you got to throw the phone away. This thing is nasty business. Interesting. Wow. Okay. It did not go into how it gets on your device. So I would assume this, you know, this is going to follow your basic like um, bait and switch where like, hey, here is, here's an app that you need to install in order to access XYZ or here's a phishing email, like click this link to install our newest version or, you know, what, like whatever the phishing of the day is. You guys, we talk about phishing all the time, but this right here. Nasty business. And now here's a word from our That's code 42.com forward slash show me. Yeah, it would be interesting to dissect. Hydra Darknet market and seizes $25 million in Bitcoin. Germany's Federal Criminal Police Office on Tuesday announced the official takedown of Hydra, the world's largest illegal dark web marketplace. Dude, what are we talking about? This was last week. Over $5 billion in Bitcoin transactions to date. 
the agency attributed the shutdown of Hydra to an extensive investigation operation conducted by its Central Office for Combating Cybercrime in partnership with U.S. law enforcement that has been underway since August 2021. Launched in 2015, Hydra was a Russian-language darknet marketplace used to conduct illicit sales of stolen credit cards, SIM cards, and counterfeit documents and IDs, while also allowing the ability to obfuscate digital transactions through regional exchanges and extended money laundering tactics. This according to a May 2021 report from Flashpoint. All right, so... I don't know why they're covering this story. They covered it twice last week, which is a little unusual. They kind of had two different angles on it. This is just straight up like last week's news. So maybe, I don't know, maybe CISO series had a long weekend too, right? Getting after it. So I guess all I'll say is around this, shutting down, you know, the, the largest dark place, dark place, largest dark net marketplace is great. Um, just following the story, it looks like Russia has shut down four dark web marketplaces. Again, I don't know the size of these dark web marketplaces because if they're little rinky dink operations, who cares, right? Shutting down uh, a flea market in Omaha isn't really big news. Shutting down like Walmart is big news, right? So you can just see that there's big money traveling through these marketplaces. It even said in the previous story here, this Hydra one, that Hydra in its first couple months of activity did $500 million worth of business. So half a billion dollars worth of business traversing through this marketplace. So it's not it's not small potatoes. Hackers are increasingly targeting UK small businesses. According to the UK government's latest annual cybersecurity breaches survey, 48% of British small businesses have identified a cyber attack over the past 12 months, and 31% say they are now being attacked at least once a week. The report also suggests only 37% of small businesses have a formal cybersecurity strategy in place, and that one in five attacks have direct negative consequences ranging from financial costs to a loss of data. The average bill for each such attack was around £3,000 for small businesses, <clears throat> and the report was published in part to draw attention to a government-run cybersecurity program for a small business called Cyber Essentials. Okay, so a couple things. I have a couple. I have a hot take. Stay, stand back. I have a hot take. I didn't test my sound effects. Uh, before, so I'm not going to touch those in case I like nuke my audio like I normally do. But check this out: a couple things. One, this says it's a UK story, so you know what's up, uh, UK people in chat. Hackers are targeting small businesses. This isn't a UK problem. This is like an everywhere problem. Um, small businesses obviously are terrible at information security. Large businesses aren't great at it. They just have more resources to devote to it. Small businesses, oftentimes they have outsourced IT if they even have IT, because it takes nothing now with cloud services to just stand, um, to just stand up um, some type of cloud you know, website and uh, uh, drop shipping platform or something like that. Like you can do small business wicked easy, okay? They show a brick and mortar, but you know, I think that's a little misleading because a lot of businesses are not brick and mortar. So targeting them is obviously quite appealing, right? They, they, they're not going to catch you. They don't have audit logs. They probably aren't going to pay to have someone um, come, come in and handle incident response, et cetera. So they are juicy. The reason that they're not as targeted as often is because think about return on investment, right? If I'm going to commit a crime, if I'm going to do unauthorized access and wire transfers and all these things, right? If I'm going to commit a crime, it doesn't like... If I attack a mid-sized business and make $12 million or I t attack um, a, a mom and pop shop and make $12,000, it's the same crime. You know, the financial piece of it may increase the, um, the punishment, like the years of jail time and stuff like that, possibly. I'm not a lawyer. But my thing is, like, if you're going to commit the crime, go for the gold. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're just going to, what are you going to, what are you going to do with $12,000? Like, go on a, a vacation and then come back and commit another crime? No, like pop it and go for retirement. So I think that's why small businesses are targeted, but not, you know, not as often. The other, the hot take I've got guys is that because it says UK and the small business is being targeted and follow me with this lapsus group, that 16 year old uh, was the mastermind behind it. I wonder, I, I, I am curious if there is a wave of younger talent in the UK area that are getting exposed somehow, whether through, you know, curriculum in the school systems or some 
effort, um, strategic effort by the um, UK government or the English government, like through STEM programs, that these kids came up and now they're reaching an age where they want things that they can't afford and get and have and they have skills to get money and they know about crypto and NFTs and all these other things. So they're 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 going going for it. I'm curious. I, I wonder if that lapsus kid is a one off or if he's an indicator of a larger kind of cultural phenomena, because if I was a 16 year old, I'd be more likely to attack a small business than a, you know, Chase Bank just because of of fear of being caught or identified thinking that a small business would be an easier prey, right? It's like trying to take down uh, like a wounded antelope instead of going after the lead lead of the, uh, the trail, right? I don't know. These, these, <laughs> these metaphors I come up with are silly sometimes. Windows Auto Patch steals the fun from Patch Tuesdays. Microsoft has announced that Windows Auto Patch, a service designed to automatically keep Windows and Office software up to date, will be released in July 2022. It is a new managed service offered for free to all Microsoft customers who already have a Windows 10 slash 11 Enterprise E3 or above license. According to Lior Bela, a senior product marketing manager at Microsoft, quote, this service will keep Windows and Office software on enrolled endpoints up to date automatically at no additional cost. The second Tuesday of every month will be just another Tuesday, end quote. The change is intended to move the update orchestration from organizations to Microsoft with the burden of planning the update process, including rollout and sequencing, no longer on the shoulders of organizations, IT teams. Okay, I guess we're doing this, people. Um, <laughs> um, we'll see how this works, guys. Um, with, with, you know, I appreciate that they're at least doing it in, in um, like deployment rings. So you're obviously going to have your test systems in the center, your IT team in the second ring, probably power users in the third, and then general user population. But there's like Patch Tuesday and applying patches. It, that's not the problem. The problem is like when things break and being able to identify when they break, like, like having Carl log in on Tuesday and click update now, like that wasn't the problem, Microsoft, you know, I, I don't know. Let me know. Let me know in chat. Like, I don't think the problem was pushing the patches, right? It's managing the patch management process. So this could go horrible. This is going to be fine for small businesses and people who are using general things. This is not going to be good for businesses that have custom stuff, custom situations, custom software, um, you know, apps that don't support Windows 11 or whatever, or a patch that breaks something. What, like, okay, wh wh what's the rollback strategy here, huh? They're talking about the patches go this way. What's the rollback strategy, man? Are they going to automatically roll back too? Or is that going to be like a, you know, uh, what's it called when you, when they go, when the doctor checks you in the, in the, in the, in the places you don't like and endoscopy, whatever, it's going to be painful when you, when they try to back out of these things. So I'm, I'm particularly curious. I'm going to try spicy. Here we go. Oh no. Yes. This one. Great idea. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, I'm, like we, they already make it easy for end users to automatically update their machine to Windows 11, and that's gone off swimmingly, right, people? No, it's been a hot mess on fire. So by giving me the auto patches, son, get out of here with that noise. Ian Bank, with no firewall license, intrusion, or phishing protection, gets robbed. The Andhra Pradesh Mahesh Cooperative Urban Bank has 45 branches and just under $400 million of deposits, <laughs> making it one of India's smaller banks. Over three days in November 2021, more than 200 phishing emails were sent to its staff, one of which at least allowed threat actors to deploy a remote access Trojan. Since the bank had also chosen not to adopt virtual lands, the attackers were able to roam widely through its systems and core banking application. The bank had also allowed its super users to use identical passwords. The attackers created new bank accounts and moved more than $1 million worth of customers' funds into these accounts, as well as making withdrawals at 938 ATMs across India. The money was funneled to Nigeria and the UK. Okay, I'm going to be judgy here. What a bunch of idiots. Are you kidding me? You can't work in financial services and not invest in cybersecurity, you boobs. Like, what is going on here with this? No firewalls? 
no intrusion detection, no phishing protection, super admins able to use the same password. Idiots. And then, and then like, there's no network segmentation. Like I get it's a small bank. I get it. But they had $400 million under a assets under management. I think you can swing some sec ops people. Good God. This is the dumbest. Like I tell people all the time, listen, financial services, going to get paid great high stress level because that's where the money is and that's where threat actors go are you joking me this this right here is where like whoever's in charge of this bank gross negligence i don't know if they they in india i don't know if they insure people's money like they do in the united states with the fdic but their money i hope is protected whoever is in charge over there i'm telling you right now the business definitely made a conscious decision not to invest in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity isn't like this fringe concept that people don't know about. It's been around for like 15 years and in financial services and in um, federal government, it's been around longer than that. So the fact that this was like this, by the way, didn't have a valid firewall license. You know what that means? So they had a firewall that wasn't working correctly because they were trying to do it on the cheap. Get out of here. God, like this is annoying to me. Like, you know what? I don't, I get it. I get it that you can't invest everything. You've got to be strategic. That's why GRC exists, right? Where do we invest our money? Where do we invest our money? But when you consciously decide to just ignore it, that is gross negligence. And I don't have any patience or any tolerance for that. It's, it's despicable, man. I get out of here. Remember, we're taking two weeks off from Cyber oh, that Friday just, this week. I don't know if they intentionally did that story last just to light me up, but I'm telling you right now, this it, like this is on the level of remote desktop open to the internet. I cannot tolerate this like incompetence and, and just negligence. Okay. Uh, I'm cool. I'm cool. All right. Listen, this Thursday, hold on. I really need a, br a breath here. Okay. So this Thursday, give me some music. Where's DJ shadow. Okay. Listen, this Thursday on simply cyber live, we are having Stacy Loki and myself co-host. It's going to be a special edition of Simply Cyber Live. It's different than me interviewing someone and giving value and information that way. We're doing a radio call in experience from real people who have broken to the cybersecurity industry in the last 12 months. So everybody that you're going to hear from except me on that call broken in the last 12 months and it's going to be rapid fire. We're going to try to rip through 30 people and it's going to be hey We've got, you know, whatever. Um, we've got Tom, who's a SOC analyst, broke in three months ago. Tom, how you doing? Good. What, what's your best tip? Like, what helped you break in, right? Like, real stories about what really works for real people who have really broken in in the last 12 months. I am super, super pumped about this particular episode. I've been wanting to do something like this for a while. So definitely join us. You're going to want to. It's going to be fun. It's going to be lively. It's going to be engaging. And I am looking forward to it it'll be much more therapeutic and relaxing than that story about that bank for sure Woo! okay guys thanks so much uh for being here it's look at this we did it right on time 8 29 uh i hope you've enjoyed um you know first things first i'll try to get the simply cyber website fixed so you can go to simply cyber.io slash ftf to come back to the next streams share it with your friends share it with your colleagues Again, thanks to Barricade Cyber Solutions for sponsoring the stream. Definitely, if you guys are hit with ransomware, you might want to call Eric Taylor and the group over there, and they can definitely help you. It's Monday, April 11th. Tomorrow, i still still teaching at the Citadel, guys. So until the end of April, it'll be Tuesday at 10 a.m. I hope you can join us for First Things First. It's been good. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great Monday.